We often settle for the flesh, don't we? The spoils, the rewards. Greedy Balaam loved the rewards of the ministry and failed to hear our reward is in him. God says, My, your reward's in me, Abram. Christians want treasures in earth when they can have them in heaven. After these words, after these words, can you see it's always immediately after this, after that test, when he wouldn't take the spoils, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram and the vision said, don't worry, Abram, don't fear that you've given away that not take the spoils. I'm your shield and I'm your great reward. You don't need a reward for doing that. I'm your reward. Let God be your reward. Let God be your treasure. Do you understand? Don't, don't take it from the world. And God began to show more of his plan. And Abraham asked God a question. Do you know, faith asks questions. Oh, you can't question God, that's not faith. Well, if it's a question of doubt, true. But what if it's a question of faith? Did you know there's a difference? You can ask God a question and it can be because of doubt. But Abraham believed God. This was a question of faith. And you know what he said? He said, Lord, how will the plan be fulfilled? You keep talking to me about my seed will inherit the land, my seed, my seed, but I haven't got any seed. But I believe you. He believed God. So he said, how will you bring it about? Not I don't believe you. Prove it to me. Give me a sign. Give me a fleece. He believed God. So he said, Lord, how will you bring it about? That's a question of faith, not doubt. Can you see the difference? He believed God. But he could only think in the flesh because that's the natural thing to do. Without revelation, you look to the natural. He says, listen, God, how will you bring... He said, I'm childless, obviously. I'm an old man, I'm childless. My wife is past bearing anyway. So, how will you bring... Well, Lord, one born in my own house will be my heir. That was a custom. If you had no children, your chief steward, who looked after all your money and your finance and your servants, he was a wealthy man... He would get the inheritance, wouldn't he? You left your inheritance to the, the chief steward. So he said, well, he's my heir. I'm going to leave everything. I've no children. I'll leave everything to him. It must be through him. He was just thinking he would believe God because that was a custom. So Abram asked a question. We've got to be careful not to criticise Abram, haven't we? A lot of preachers criticise him so many times, and yet he's the father of faith. So be careful to criticise these great men of God. As all they, they got it wrong there, they get it wrong. They're on a wonderful journey, and we'll have to go through the same journey. Don't think that you can escape what they went through. You can't. And so he believed the promise would uh, be fulfilled. And he said, God, how will it work out? It must be through Eliezer. There's nothing wrong with that. That's not sin. It's just, how will it be? And God dropped a bombshell, really. He told him the seed would come from his own loins. He never knew that. All the time God has said, your seed will do this, your seed. But he must have thought it was through Eliezer because he said, Lord, how will it come about? It must be through Eliezer. Amazing, isn't it? That an old man with a barren wife would have seed through his old loins. He thought it would through Eliezer. But he believed God. When God said, no, it's not through your seed. Actually, you're going to produce from your own seed. Genesis 15. He believed God. And he believed in the Lord. And he counted it him for righteousness. So don't criticise him for asking the question. Because when God told him, he believed God and it was counted for righteousness. This is nothing to do with a sermon, but it's maybe relevant. I was always looking at the bloodline. The bloodline of Jesus from Adam through... Do you know it never mentions bloodline in the Bible? I got a shock. It's the occult that follow the bloodlines. Did you know that? Change your thinking. Do you know what's in the Bible? It's the seed. The seed of Abram, the seed of... It's the man's seed, not the bloodline. You'll be deceived. I, I've been following the bloodline for years. But it doesn't work like that. It's the seed. Always the seed, which is different. Because the blood doesn't come from the father. 
I've heard people say, well, the bloodline, it comes through the father. Is that right? It's not true. There's a medical man, and he told me, because preachers say, it doesn't come from mother, it's Abraham, Isaac, the bloodline comes through the male. It's not true. We now know through science that it can be from either. It's not true. And I, I was asking Stephen, and I said, yeah, but Stephen, it comes through the man. It's not. And he convinced me medically and showed me that it doesn't. And I thought, well, what about the bloodlines then? And I looked in the Bible and it never mentions the bloodline. The DNA comes from the seed. It's the DNA, not the blood. You can have a different blood than your father. But you get the same DNA. It's the DNA that you get the seed of your father. It's the seed. If you've not thought about that, I studied it. I couldn't find the bloodline in the Bible. It's always the seed of Abram, your seed. He never said your bloodline, did he? Your bloodline, your, he says, your seed will inherit the earth. Your seed will go into him. Your seed never mentions bloodlines anywhere in the Bible. All the occult mention the bloodlines. You know, Jesus married Mary Magdalene. And they follow the occult bloodlines through the Merovingian kings and through all the bloodline. You know, have you seen the Da Vinci Code? It's all about the bloodline, isn't it? It's the occult, the bloodline. It's the seed that matters. Adam and Eve, your seed, your seed, not your bloodline. The seed of the serpent, the seed of God. It's all about the seed, the DNA, the character, not the blood. The blood could come from either. So maybe you didn't know that. I didn't know that. I found that this year, so I'm not criticising you, but I'm willing to change you. You know, I'm willing to change. When I find out bloodlines are not in the Bible, I better start talking about the seed. And it makes sense to me, the seed of... Anyway, that's not in the study, but I thought I'd just throw that in because these little things are important. It changes your whole thinking, doesn't it? <coughs> you and your seed. Abraham asked God another question. It was Abraham at this time, not Abraham, and God changed his name. God hasn't changed his name yet because he was still in the flesh. When you get... You get changed when you're becoming a friend of God and he changes your name. So he's still Abram. He asked him another, he says, how will I know that my seed will be like the stars of heaven? He said, now you've said it'll come from my own loins. It, it wasn't a question of doubt, it was a question of faith. Lord, how will you bring it out? How will I know? You see, he didn't expect to live for the next 2,000 years to see. He knows that his seed, he can't see the seed as the stars of heaven, can he? How many generations will he see? He'll have a son, a son, a son great-grandson, but it looked like the stars and he said, Lord, how will it happen? Because he knew we wouldn't live to see it. So he's asking a genuine question. Is How will I know? Because I'll be dead. I believe you, but how will I know? I believe it was a, a question of faith. It's a narrow line, I know. And God revealed more of his plans to Abram because he could trust him more. Genesis 15, 8. So God started to share his thoughts. This is the first time that I think that God shared with Abram things that wasn't just personal to Abram. You know, your seed will this and your seed that. But now he started sharing the plan of God to Abram. Let's read it. He told him the future. He said, how will I know that my seed will be like this? God says, I'll tell you what will happen to your seed. And he said unto Abram, know the surety, your seed, not the bloodline, your, blood, your seed shall be a stranger in a land that's not theirs. You're going down to Egypt and they shall serve them and afflict them 400 years. He actually told them exactly how many years they would have been in Egypt. Being it. Don't you think that's amazing? He's now giving him details. Look, you know it'll come to pass because I'll give you the details. It's not general now, your stars will be like heaven. Actually, you're going to Egypt, they'll afflict them 400 years. And I'll judge the nation that uh, they've served, and afterwards they shall come out with great substance, and you shall go to your fathers in peace. You'll be buried in a good old age, but in the fourth generation, he's telling him how it'll work. Lord, how will it happen? In the fourth generation, they'll come hither again, out of Egypt, now a nation, from 70 people to two and a half million, 
He says, this is how it'll work. I'll make them a nation. They'll, they'll serve people and become a great nation. And then they'll come out again for the iniquity of the Amorites is, is not yet full. So they've got to wait 400 years till they're wicked enough for me to judge them. And then he, he went through this strange experience with the smoking furnace, the burning lamps, etc. And God made a covenant with him. There's too much. It, it's a, a week study every night to go through all that happened with Abram and his covenant. So I'm missing that. I'm talking about his obedience and faith, all right? And uh, what about 13 to 18? Is that it, Joe? Abram must have told Sarah. I believe Abram, Abram and Sarah were very close. I believe they loved her very much. I believe they were very close. And uh, I believe he told Sarah, Sarah, God's spoken to me. You know that God said, uh, you know, our seed would be like the stars of heaven. Well, we thought it was Eliezer. Do you think they didn't talk about it? Stand in Abram's shoes, God speaks to you. Do you think he didn't say, Sarah, we've got to leave the home, we've got to go to a land that God will show us. She was part of it. You share things with your wife, don't you? And when God said, you... <laughs> Your, your, your seed will be like the stars of heaven. Do you don't think he shared it with his wife? And when he said to Sarah, Sarah, God's just spoken to me. It's not Eliezer, you know. We've talked about it. We thought we'll leave all our adherence to Eliezer. His seed will carry on. It's not through him. It's through my own loins. What a shock for Sarah when she was barren. So she believed Abram, but she thought, well, like, I can't have anything to do with that, I'm barren. He can put his seed in me for the next hundred years, I won't bear, I'm barren. She was a woman of faith. She acted in the flesh, in the natural, because she didn't know. And she thought, well, I'll tell you what, Abram, then. I'll give you my handmaid to be your wife, which was the custom, it was legitimate. If a man had a wife and he was wealthy and she stopped bearing children... Because children were your inheritance, then the wife would say, well, we've only got three children. Have my handmaid as a wife, a concubine, a wife, and bring up seed through her. That was the custom. It was just doing what was natural, you see, in the flesh, because he believed God. And she said, well, I'll give you Hagar, my handmaid. Make love to her and have seed, and that's how God will do it. They were only working out God's plan. Don't criticise them. They were, Sarah was acting in faith by giving a handmaid so Abram could have seed. Can you see it was an act of faith, not sin? There's nothing sinful about that. That was the custom. A man could have more than one wife. It, it, it was the custom, you see, so don't criticise. Was Abram wrong to listen to his wife? People say, oh, he listened to his wife. And it produced Ishmael. He should have never listened to his wife. This time's when you shouldn't listen to your wife, men. Abram shouldn't have listened to Eve. Because you've listened to your wife, God said. That was Adam said he listened to his wife. She listened to the serpent, but he listened to his wife. But he wasn't wrong because another time, God said, listen to your wife, do what your wife says. We'll see it. Sometimes your wife can give you good advice, and it was, it was not sin. She was doing the natural thing. They were acting in faith. They were working towards the promises. Well, God didn't say Abram was wrong. The Bible never criticises Abram for going with Hagar or for producing Ishmael. So see, we shouldn't. If the Bible criticises, let's us criticise. If it doesn't, let's leave it with God. We have to understand God's plan, don't we, before we make judgment on men. That God's chosen to fulfil his will. Yeah, but he shouldn't have done that. You don't know what God's chosen for him. You don't know God's plan for his life. Genesis 16.1 Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, bare him no children, and she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And so he went to Hagar. And Hag uh, Ishmael was born four years later. He was 86 years old. So it's a brave old age, isn't it? Some men have stopped being fruitful you don't say men are barren, but you say they're unfruitful. There's lots of men, and they, they, they couldn't produce children when they get old. Some men are very old to a very old age. Some, some are not, at quite a young age. 
You'd be surprised. I, I, I was surprised because Stephen, that was one of his specialities in the medical field. And I was surprised he said some men at, at quite a young age, you know, couldn't give children or, or become impotent. It's just, you know, don't judge everyone by Cosmopolitan magazine, will you? For goodness sake, you know, I mean, it's not like that in the real world, is it? Unless you all have to have 2.3 children and I don't know how you get the point too. Well, Abram now had his son. Stand in Abram's shoes. Ishmael is the child of promise. God never said it would be through Sarah at this time. Abram didn't know it was going to be through Sarah. God didn't tell him. So he wasn't disobedient to go with Hagar. This was the child of promise. He brought Ishmael up as though his seed would be like the stars of heaven. How would he know? You'll find God hadn't told him it would be through Sarah. It was only through him and the son was through him. So Ishmael was the child of promise to Abram. And after that, God changed his name. He's acting obedience in faith, in the flesh. So he produced the man of the flesh, Ishmael, granted. But this is how you become to get an Isaac. You've got to act in the light you're in. If you won't act in faith in the light you're in, how will you ever get the Isaac? God's promised it. Yes, great, Sarah. This is the child of promise. And God, uh, God came to him and changed his name. So God wasn't displeased at the Ishmael, was he? Because God changed his name after. And name denotes character. So God's saying, you're becoming a friend. I'm changing your name because your character's changing. He's getting towards being a friend of God. And God called him Abraham, not Abram. And he did the same to Sarah. So she also was a woman of faith who got her name changed at the same time. God changed Sarah's name also, Sarai's name to Sarah. So she must have been a partaker of the change of character and the walk of faith. You can't separate Abram and Sarah. They're just as faithful. Sarah's the example of a woman. If you want to be like a godly woman, be like Sarah, who called her husband Lord. That's the example of Sarah in the New Testament. Not De Deborah, not Ruth. Never mentions Ruth in the New Testament as an example. The, the example of a godly woman is Sarah. Abram's the father of faith. And Sarah was there with him. I want to follow Abram and I hope my wife wants to follow Sarah. Who became fruitful and bore the promise of God. You work together as a man and wife, don't you? Women, look at Sarah's life. I'm studying Abram. But she was parallel. She was part of the faith. She helped him. Even in the flesh, in the light he was in, she supported him in every way. Sacrificed her marriage and let another woman come in to fulfil the promise, according to the custom. So God changed uh, his name and made a covenant. And then God dropped another bombshell. He told him his seed would be through Sarah, but he'd already got the child of promise. He'd already got Ishmael. Ishmael was now 13 years old. He'd had the child of promise for 13 years. His seed was going to cover the, the earth like the stars of heaven. And then God said, he's not the one. What do you think about that? After 13 years of having the promise of God, and God says, no, that's not the promise. It's the promise of the flesh, but not the spirit. Think about it. After 13 years of believing this child of promise, Ishmael, when God told him, he said, oh, may Ishmael live before you. He couldn't understand it. He said, actually, I'm sorry, Abram. I know you've believed it and you've acted in faith, but it's not the one. The one I choose has got to be through Sarah. It's got to be you and Sarah, not you. Listen, if you're a married man, you can't fulfil the promises of God without your wife to what God expected. You've got to work as a team. You're one. Don't think you can do it on your own. And sometimes God's got to separate and break a marriage because they can't get unity. Can't do it. You've got to, you've got to work together. They had to work together. And all of the, they produced the flesh. God said, no, it's through that. God, 
Sarah's womb was necessary, just as, as important as Abram's seed. Can you see? What good is the seed if you haven't got the right womb? Hagar wasn't the right womb. This woman wasn't the right womb. A beautiful, pure woman wasn't the right womb. It had to be Sarah. If you're married, you need your wife, men. You've got to fulfil the promises together. And if you can't, God may separate you, God may do, or you may never fulfil the promise. Because if God's called you together, that's how the seed will come, your seed and her womb. Do you understand? Because you can't get life without the two. You need the seed and you need the womb, is that right? If I spill my seed on the floor, will it produce life? If a woman has a fruitful womb, will it produce children without the seed? No. You need the seed and the womb. Can you see the partnership of a man and woman? There's a lot I, can't, I could bring out here, but it's important because this is a man and his wife. If you're called as a single man, that's great. This doesn't apply. But God called Abram and Sarah. He said, leave everyone. He didn't say, leave your wife. Do you, do you understand? So the wife was necessary. That was the, the sacred womb. God had chosen it. That's why he protected it with Pharaoh. Don't touch a Pharaoh. That womb's important. God protected it. Abram tried to protect it and say, tell him you're my sister, to protect his seed. God says, what about protecting your wife's womb? But he didn't think it was through his wife's womb, so God had to do that. Do you understand? He protected his own seed. God says, you, you don't know it's through Sarah, but I'll protect her, don't worry. I'll curse Pharaoh for you so you'll know when you look back. I hope you're getting your own lessons through this, looking at your own life. Let, let me go on. We've, we'll come to the end. What a bombshell. And Abram laughed. And Sarah laughed. You know they both laughed, don't you? People think Sarah laughed, but Abram laughed, it says. I'm not surprised. I mean, all right, I'm an old man, but may I'm, maybe you can produce a bit of life from me. But a dead womb, <laughs> a dead womb, you know. It's not possible, women, is it? A dead womb. There's no eggs there, there's no, nothing there to fertilise. So even if the man God does a miracle and makes him fertile and he puts his seed in you, if there's no eggs to fertilise, there's no birth. And when the eggs have gone, they've gone, is that right? You only have so many women and when they're gone, they're gone. So, so it's not like, oh... So of course he laughed. <laughs> that wasn't a lack of faith, that was, whoa, impossible God. Like, <laughs> can't happen, Lord, you know. But we've got all things are possible, only believe, Abram. God says, I'll give you a child through Sarah. But at the same little meeting with God, when God spoke to him and said, no, he's not the child of promise, it's Isaac. Well, it's not Isaac, it's through your wife. He told them to do something. He says, Abram, in the same verses, I'll read it. He says, I want you to circumcise yourself and all your household and Ishmael. Did you know Ishmael was circumcised before Isaac was born? We say, oh, Ishmael and all that. He was circumcised, a seal of God. That's a seal, isn't it? Circumcises you, so you know that you're my people. If you was a Gentile, Goyim, and you wanted to become one of God's people, you had to be circumcised. It's a seal. Well, Ishmael was circumcised before Isaac was even born. That's amazing, isn't it? He has an important part to play in God's plan, Ishmael, and he was circumcised. And Abram, how old was he? Ishmael was 13 years old when his father circumcised. Abram was now 100. Goodness me, what an age to get circumcised. I wouldn't like to do it now, men. If God, you know, if I had to be circumcised, I wish I'd have done it when I was eight days old and I never knew anything about it. I wouldn't want to, it's, it's painful, isn't it? If you don't know, ask Stephen because that's, you know, it's painful when you're old to be circumcised. And he was a hundred years old and was circumcised. And all his household, and Ishmael was circumcised. Genesis 17, let's read it. Abram was 90 years old and nine, sorry, 99, when he circumcised the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 30. Isn't it funny, Bar Mitzvah, 13, 13 years old, when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. Joni gave me a tremendous revelation, not for this conference, but before. I'll give her credit because she's here. 
Because otherwise she'll say, that was my revelation. And I'll say, yes, dear, you're right. Do you want to know it? I was amazed and it's, it's great. When Abram made love to Hagar to produce Ishmael, he was uncircumcised. Yeah? So he produced the flesh. When God gave him the promise it'll come through Sarah, he said, get circumcised. And he circumcised himself and made love to Sarah and a year later he had Isaac. You can't produce an Isaac till you've been circumcised. If you're not circumcised, you'll produce the Ishmaels. So unless your heart is circumcised, you understand, we have to go through circumcision of the heart. Because if your heart's not circumcised, you can make love all you want, you can do what you want, you'll produce the flesh. Because you've not had the flesh rolled away. Circumcision is a cutting off of the flesh. That's what happens, you cut off the foreskin and throw it away. It's useless, it's dead. You have to be exposed, don't you? The heart's got to be... So unless the flesh is cut off and rolled away, how can you produce an Isaac? Uncircumcision produces the flesh. Circumcision produces the spirit. I thought that was great. That he said, now it's going to be through Sarah, so you better get circumcised, because you can't make love to Sarah when you're uncircumcised. You know, if he'd made love to Sarah before he'd have circumcised, she'd have born a child of the flesh. Because the womb's neutral, isn't it? Sarah didn't have to do anything. It was Abram had to be circumcised. She didn't have to go through anything. A womb's a womb, isn't it? It's the seed that's important. You need circumcising. Don't put uncircumcised seed into that womb. Great principle, isn't it? How can we produce a child of promise? How can we fulfil the promises of God? Well, we haven't had the flesh cut away. No circumcision, no Isaac. So Christians are trying to produce the promises that God's given them. God's given Christians lots of promises, so they try to fulfil them, but they've not been circumcised, so they keep producing another Ishmael, another Ishmael, another Ishmael, child of the flesh, that persecute the spirit when it comes, because Ishmael persecutes Isaac. I believe Abram was now a friend of God because God began to share his plans for Abram. God trusted Abraham. You know, God's got to build trust up in... Well, I've learnt to trust God. Wonderful brother, wonderful sister. Has God learnt to trust you? What did the last tell you to do? Did you fulfil it? What did God last ask you to do, or did you renege on it? Did you say, well, I don't think it's that way. God's told me to do this, but uh, situations have arisen, so I've got to change the plan. Did God tell you to change the plan? Or have you changed the plan because of pressure, or fears, or... Can God trust you when he tells you to do something? Can you do it to the letter? Or when circumstances you come and say, well, I know God said that, but maybe God's changed his mind, maybe God meant this way. Maybe he did, but if he hasn't told you, you're wrong. You can't act on your impulses or pressures, external pressures, can you? You all big. Is God learning to trust you? Because you can't fulfil the plan of God till he can trust you explicitly. Because he was going to ask Abraham to kill his own son, so he had to build up some trust. If God's going to ask you to do something mighty, he's got to build up trust in you. And you've got to build up trust in God. But it's a two-way You've got faith in God, has God got faith in you? Oh, God could do anything. But God looks at me and says, well, Morris can't do anything, everything. I tell him he gets it wrong. He keeps listening to other people. Has God got faith in you that if he tells you, you'll fulfil the plan of God? It's a two-way thing. Relationship is two-way. I've got to learn to trust my wife and I've got to make sure that it's well-founded. But she's got to trust me. Works two ways, doesn't it? You've got to build up the trust between you. So every little move he made was important, every little step of faith. My dad taught me there's no such thing as small decisions. Big doors swing on little hinges. A massive door 
the size of that wall, a massive door, can swing on a little hinge. A, a whole ship, 50,000 tonnes, is turned by a little wheel. There's no little decisions. Just a little degree here. When you've gone 20 miles, you, you've missed the target. There's no small decisions. Just a little bit to the left, a little bit of deviation. Well, I know God said it, but I'm, I've done most of what God said. I just kept a few cattle, you know, to worship. He lost the kingship, Saul, didn't he? Got to be diligent. Every decision has consequences for the rest of your life. Let me say it again. Every decision you make has consequences for the rest of your life. So be diligent. If you want to be an intercessor, God's watching every move you make. Every little move in your house, in your work, everything you do, God's watching every move. Nothing misses his attention. Your mistakes, your failures, your lack of faith, your great faith, God's watching everything. And we learn through mistakes. Doesn't mean you won't make mistakes, God's just watching. How do you react with your mistakes? Do you pick yourself up and say, let's start again? Or do you say, oh, that's finished? You pick yourself up, don't you? I'm a Christian. I don't, of course I've failed a thousand times, but I'm going to start again, Lord. Give me another chance. He's watching. Why do I think Abraham's becoming a friend of God? Because he's becoming an intercessor. God's now burdening Abram with what God's going to do. He's sharing his secrets and God shares what he's going to do. Abram, yeah, the one before, Jay. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abram the things I'm going to do? Does God share things with you he's going to do? See, in Abram shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth will bless through this man. He's proved himself. Why don't I share my secrets? And he shared that he was going to destroy Sodom because he knew the heart of Abram, that Abram would plead and stand in the gap for Lot. And so he shared it with Abram. And of course it caused Abram to intercede for Lot. We don't need to look at his prayer, we know he stood in the gap. Can you see, first he, he stood in intercession in the flesh, he went and fought. Now he's standing before God for Lot. Can you see the progression? First he went and fought with his bare hands and his men to rescue Lot in the flesh. Now he's lifted his hands and rescuing Lot in the spirit. He's now had his name changed. He's now a friend of God. So he's, he's now got an Isaac, not an Ishmael. So instead of fighting in the flesh and interceding in the flesh, he's now doing it in the spirit and he says to God, Lord, no fighting, will you save Lot? Why didn't he take his armed men and rescue Lot out of the city before it was destroyed? Think about it. That's what he did before. He got his horsemen, his men, his swords. He said, let's rescue Lot. Why didn't he go into Sodom and rescue Lot before God destroyed it? Different man. No fighting in the flesh now, Lord. If there's 50, narrowed it down to 10, didn't he? That was probably Lot and his family. Lot and his wife, the three sons and the three daughters. They didn't come out as only Lot and his wife and the two daughters, wasn't it? Maybe they left the husbands. I imagine 10 would be the number that Abraham was interceding for. Can you see it now he's interceding in the spirit? The problem is if I pray for Manchester that prayer, nothing will happen. Because I'm not the friend of God. The key is becoming the person that God listens to. And Abram's prayer is Genesis 18, but it's 10 verses. Well, if you want to read it sometime, that's the prayer of intercession. It's not long. 10 verses. Doesn't take three hours to pray that, does it? I bet you could pray it in two minutes. Intercession is brief. But it takes 50 years to become the man to pray the five-minute prayer. To save. Do you understand the, what it's about? It takes your lifetime to become the person that you say a brief prayer and fire come down from heaven, etc. All right. That wasn't the end of Abram's intercession, of changing God's mind from judgment to mercy. Because <coughs> he said, don't judge Lot in Sodom, have mercy, and God did. <coughs> The ultimate act of intercession was not prayer at all, it was an act. 
Abel still needs to be obedient for his last act. He responded to God's call immediately. Abram, I want to sacrifice your son, your beloved son. I want you to go and sacrifice him to me. He responded to God's call immediately. Went a three days journey, just like immediately. He left her. Now we've gone on 20, 30 years and God says, now go and kill your son. Yes, Lord. No questions, no how will it be, what will I do? He believed God so much, the Bible says in in New Testament, he believed God so much because he expected to kill his son that when he killed his son, God would raise him from the dead to fulfil the promise. That's why he could do it. He believed, he said, he believed God, that God could raise him from the dead. He was going to do it. It's all right. God, I know my God. He will fulfil his promise and he'll raise him from the dead. He believed God. He had the character of Jesus. You know, Jesus had to believe his father that he will not leave my soul in hell, nor let my body see corruption. Jesus died in faith. It's no guarantee that he would rise from the dead because if his father didn't raise him, he wouldn't be raised. So I'll say that again. Jesus had to die in faith because if his father didn't rise him from the dead, he'd still be in the grave now. But he believed God. He had the promise, you won't leave my soul in hell. You won't allow my body to see corruption. And God made sure that he never saw corruption. Third day he rose again before he corrupted. But Jesus had to die in faith, believing God would raise him. When you're dead, you have no power. How can he exercise his will when he's dead? How can he have faith when he's dead? A dead man has no faith. Jesus was dead. Rotted if God didn't resurrect him. He had the faith of Jesus Christ. If I kill my son, God will raise him from the dead. God was using Abram to role play what he was going to do. That's unbelievable. It was a dress rehearsal. Forgive me using those terms. It was a dress rehearsal. One day God was going to do the same to his own son. I wonder if he wanted to know how Abram would feel. I wondered if he wanted, because it cost God, you know, to kill his own son. I wonder if he was seeing a dress rehearsal and thinking, I've got to do that with my son one day. Do you think God doesn't have feelings? Do you think God could do it callously and just kill his own son? He was watching Abram and, and you, you know, when you watch a film and it's sad, you cry, don't you? You feel sad. Why? Because you're role-playing. You're role-playing when you watch a film. And God was role-playing, watching, and having the feelings of a father having to sacrifice his own son. God was going through it with Abram, surely. Why do it? It's a prophecy, it's a shadow, it's a role-play. Do you understand? Your life is a role-play. God is watching you. You can fulfil God's plans for the future in your actions and your life. Terrific to be an intercessor. You're part of God's plan. You're prophesying the plan of God when you're an intercessor. And Abraham was chosen to role play God. You know, if you're an actor and somebody says, I want you to play Queen Victoria, what a privilege. You know, I don't, I don't want you to role play a, anybody, a stand in. I want you to, what a privilege. Or some great man of the past. Uh, Napoleon or somebody. What Fancy role-playing Napoleon or some great man. Imagine role-playing God. Killing his own son. Can you see it? It's amazing, isn't it? That Abram was chosen. Came through the test. Remarkable man. Wonderful example. Let's just read it. Hebrews 11. I'm coming to a fit close now. By faith, which means act in obedience, when he was called to go out of a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, he obeyed and he went out not knowing whether he went. By faith, he stayed in the land, sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, for he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. I've said this before, but it's unbelievable. You know, men of faith, they see past the answer to prayer. They see past this life. Abram saw, not his own inheritance, not the, he saw New Jerusalem, the city in 
that God built. That's New Jerusalem. He saw the bride of Christ. Abram saw past Moses and the law. He saw past Jesus Christ. He saw past the church. And he saw New Jerusalem coming down from heaven. The city whose builder and maker is God. He saw, can you believe? Before the law, before Jesus, and this man of faith, faith sees well past your miracle, well past your life. So what's your little life? What's my little life? They'll bury me and God will raise up somebody else. But men of faith, they see past their ministry and my little bit that I'm doing for God. They see past that. They see the bride. They see New Jerusalem. That's worth dying for, you see. That's worth sacrificing for. Abram saw it. By faith, he saw it. Before the law, before Jesus, he saw past it. What about Sarah? She's included. By faith, Sarah received strength to conceive seed. She received strength to make a barren womb. By faith. Do you know it wasn't Abram's faith alone? He had faith that his seed would be fruitful. And he was virile. Sarah believed that her dead womb would come alive. It wasn't Abram's faith. He said, by faith, eh? Sarah believed that she could have a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Don't just th talk about Abram, the man of faith. Abram and his wife are one, two become one. She was a woman of faith. She was past age, she was barren, but she believed God that a womb could produce the, the child of promise. So don't, don't forget Sarah, will you, women and men? Be encouraged, women. She was, had as much faith as Abram. It's just that it uses Abram because he's the head, he's the man. But don't neglect Sarah. She had as much faith as Abram, I believe. Unbelievable, the two of them. And she judged God faithful who'd promised. I love Sarah. She's a great example. I've never preached on her. You should preach on her. Have you preached on her? <laughs> My giddy aunt. Okay. Jody's written a book, Abra, in the footsteps of Abram. You should read it because she's coming from a woman's point of view, right? And she gets into the heart of... I've tried to get into the heart of Abram. She's got into the heart of Sarah. And she, 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 she looks at it from Sarah's point of view. So, faith's always linked to obedience, isn't it? It's recording what God told Abram after he offered Isaac. Let's just read it. I've got a couple of sentences now. This is what God said after he sacrificed Isaac. I know he was told. And God said, By myself have I sworn, said the Lord, for this, because you have done this thing and not withheld thine only son. He swore by himself and promised a bit the seed. He reiterated it, chapter, uh, verse 17 and 18. God confirmed the blessing. He, com he said that in blessing I'll bless thee, and in multiplying I'll multiply thy seed as the star of heaven, not the bloodline, the seed. And you'll possess the gates of your enemies. He never said that before. That's the first time. All the time, more revelation, more revelation, as he's been obedient. And in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. He only said your seed, but now he said every seed on the planet will be blessed through you. Never told him that before. Can you see all the time the plan's unfolding? Why? Because you've obeyed my voice. That's the key. You'll never intercede. You'll never inherit the promise because you've obeyed my voice. Job done. How old did, did he live, I, Abram? He lived to be 175 years old. You hear nothing about his life after he sacrificed Isaac. What do you hear about him? What do you know? For the last 40, 50 years, nothing, because he'd accomplished. Sometimes, Stephen said it in the beginning, God prepares you for 50 years for one act. Everything he did, intercession for Lot, fighting in the flesh, all the questions, all the faith, all the obedience, was for one act, to role-play God and sacrifice Isaac. The greatest intercession the world has ever known was Jesus on the cross, standing between sinners and the lake of fire. And Abraham was role-playing the greatest act of intercession on the planet. That act was an act of intercession that Abraham did. He was role-playing it. And when he'd done that, live happily ever after Abraham. God never asked him to do anything else because it, it's not recorded. He just lived a happily life till he died. He'd done the will of God. 
They said, when you've done the will of God, retire, rest, it's all right. What did you hear about Elijah after the prophets of Baal and that? He knew his time was good. He said, now let me die with the... Th- with the place, all right. God says, "We're well, not yet. Go and anoint somebody in your place. You need a prophet to follow on from you and anoint this king, and then I'll take you." God did take him. He wasn't wrong. He knew he'd done it. He brought God's people back to God. What more do you need? He brought the fire down from heaven. God's people had repented. Elijah had done his job. You don't hear about him after God says, "I'll take you to heaven." Now, you'll find that there's a there's a a waxing and a waning. There's a zenith. God prepares you all your life for one act. There's lots on the way, but that's the one God trained you for. And when that's done, that's all right. That's why some great men die in obscurity. Let me say that again. That's why some great men of God die in obscurity. George Jeffries, who founded, there's hundreds of church, Elim churches now that he founded. Signs and wonders. He died in obscurity. Nobody came to see him. He'd done his job. He don't, don't worry about it. Oh, God's laid him aside. He's done his job. He brought revival. Do you understand? Once you've accomplished the goal of God, that's it. That's what your whole life was about. So let me finish. So our life is a prophecy. All Abram's trials of faith were to get him to the place where he could role play God. Let's just remind ourselves, we can't produce an Isaac without an Ishmael. If you won't act in the flesh, you'll never act in the spirit. If you won't produce some life in the flesh, why would God say produce it in the spirit? There's no point. What's the point of being circumcised if you can't produce children in the flesh? Keep uncircumcised. It's, there's no point. You're not fruitful. But if you're fruitful in the flesh, God will say, ah, you know how to produce seed. All you need is circumcising and you'll produce an Isaac. So it's a, it's a progression, do you understand? Of course we don't want an Isaac. Of course I want to be perfect, but do you get perfect without making a lot of mistakes? Of course not. We act in the flesh, in the natural, at, at the light we're in, to show God we have faith. Then he unfolds our plan, then we get to the Isaac. God rarely shows us the details at the beginning because he wants us to see what we'll do with the general plan. He had a general plan, so, all right, I'll produce a child, it's my seed. Do you understand? God didn't tell him till he'd come through the tests. That's how we become the friend of God. So, Lord, help us. Lord, surely I've said something that will trigger something in our hearts, whatever it is, Lord. If it's only a sentence, I pray that we'll go home with something from this session. If it's only about circumcision of the heart, if it's only that Sarah is just as important as Abram, if we just learn something, Lord, help us, speak to us. And I pray that as we have a break now till this evening, that we'll have godly conversation, build one another up in the most holy faith. Amen. Hello, I'm Joanna Barrett. I'm Maurice Barrett's wife. If the teaching that you've just been listening to helped you to understand the subject of intercession a little bit better, then perhaps you'd like to get the book that this series of teaching is based on. This is the book. It's available as a paperback entitled Intercession. And you can get this by going onto our website, the bookshop section www.barrettministries.org.uk. Alternatively, you can go to Amazon because they stock the book too. That's Amazon.co.uk. Again, if you prefer it as an ebook or a PDF, we have that on the website. Or as a Kindle download, you can get that from Amazon. Please, can I suggest that you have a look at the website? Browse around it, because I'm sure there are subjects there that will interest you and also be very helpful. God bless you.